Some killers attack complete strangers. Some target the vulnerable, the young or the elderly. And some prey on people that they know. There are killers who are inspired by money or by revenge, by sexual deviancy, by hatred. There are opportunists and there are meticulous planners. But what unites these men and women is one simple trait. And it's the most terrifying thing of all. They live amongst us. In our towns, on our streets, in our houses. They're just like the rest of us, but capable of evil. And they could be anywhere. Welcome to Murder Town. Do you feel it in the air? Oh. Something wicked this way comes. 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 Every town in the UK has witnessed some horrors. But there are some places where murder has left its mark and will never be forgotten. I remember the day when the police confirmed that the three deaths were murders. And that obviously caused huge shockwaves. We had a serial killer on the loose. I seen my dad cover his face. And I asked him what was wrong and he said there's a body being found. To be able to do something like that to another human being is, is beyond me. They're not human. Tonight, we're in Sunderland, an industrial town in the northeast, known for shipbuilding and coal mining. I'm Nigel Green. I've been a crime and investigative journalist for 33 years, and I'm the former crime and investigative reporter at the Sunderland Echo. It's never been a prosperous place. It's always been a fairly tough place, but it was particularly tough in the late 80s and early 90s. There'd been a recent spate of closures of mines, um, shipyards, uh, there was high unemployment. Obvious consequences of that, like crime, social deprivation, glue sniffing, solvent abuse, those, those kind of issues that go with that. Although it was a tough place, I can think of very few door knocks that I went out on where people didn't talk to you. People would open the doors to you. My dad used to work at Mugwee Mouth Pit, underground as well. And he worked there from leaving school, I think. Lindsay grew up in the Roker part of town. In the early years, it was mum and dad, Lindsay, and her brother, Thomas. I had the best family I could have asked for. My mum and dad were great. We were very close. I loved it. We lived in pit houses, so everybody knew each other. Looked after each other's children if they were playing in the street. Everybody used to be out. We all had toilets outside, so it was... <laughs> it was still back, like back then, really. It was, it was nice. But while the streets of Sunderland felt like a safe place to be, there was a darkness lurking nearby. And in 1993, Lindsay's life was about to change forever. Thomas was 
He was 18, but he was like a young 18. Everybody loved him. He had a paper round. And people complained when he packed it in at the age of 18 because he used to go and knock on the doors and ask whether they needed anything from the shop or even sit and talk to them for a little bit. He was in the TA. He loved going there. He tried the army, but he got homesick and joined the TA instead. On the Friday, woke up just a normal morning. Thomas was due to go with the TA on the Saturday, and he had all of his stuff sorted out. It was all ready to go the next day. My dad came in from work. My mum got ready for work, and she went off, and it was a, a normal, normal night. Thomas didn't come home. And that was very unusual. Concerned for Thomas's safety, Lindsay and her mum began checking the likely places he might be. But in the 90s, their efforts were hampered with no mobile phones to call. The last time I seen Thomas, he was standing at the fireplace um, when I left for school. It was so unusual for him not to come home. He'd never done it before. There was something not right. We didn't have a house phone, and we relied on leaving a note on the, on the coffee table if we were going to be late home. There was no note. We thought, oh, he must have went for a drink, maybe. My dad came in from the pub. And when he wasn't with him, it, we just couldn't understand why, why he wasn't home. We um, didn't phone the police because he was 18 and we got told that they wouldn't do anything about it. It's, you know, he's old enough to be going out even though it was unusual for us and we were worried. Well, that night we all stayed up all night waiting and on the news the next day, I, I wasn't listening and I, I seen my dad cover his face and I asked him what was wrong and he said there's a body being found. The local news were reporting an unidentified body that had been found in the city, less than a mile from where Thomas lived. It had been discovered in a fire at a nearby allotment, and with no sign of Thomas all night, his family began to fear the worst. The news gave a number to ring up if, you, if anyone was missing. The police weren't very helpful on the phone at all. Uh, just said, we don't know whether it's a male or female. There's just a body being found, and then um, we'll send somebody out to see you. They didn't say, listen, we think this is Thomas. What they did was they decided to use Thomas's house key. What they took off his body and walk into my mum, mum and dad's house. They obviously thought that was Thomas coming home. But it wasn't. And now the police were there to break the news that Thomas was the body found overnight, just a stone's throw from his home. They believed his death had been self-inflicted and that Thomas had gone to the allotments alone. We all just went into shock, my mum and dad mostly. Um, I was 15, I was trying to look after them as well. We got police in and out. They took my dad away for questioning for eight hours. Come back for me. And then you've got the, the press sounding you. It was terrible. So Thomas Kelly had died. And despite the police believing otherwise, his family were convinced that there was foul play, but nobody was expecting what would happen next.
In 1993, police were looking into the suspicious death of 18-year-old Thomas Kelly. His body had been found in a burning allotment shed close to his home in Sunderland. But while his family believed he'd been lured there and possibly murdered, the official line was that there was nobody else involved. It was a discovery of a young lad in a burned out building. And, you know, sadly in those days, glue sniffers and tragedies like that weren't unusual. I don't even remember doing much on the story at the time. It was just the discovery of a lad's body. The police have said that Thomas was found in a burning shed. We couldn't understand why he would be on that allotment. It was close enough to the house, but definitely not somewhere you would go and not go alone. The police had said it's mysterious but not suspicious. And we didn't agree with that at all. And the police, they, they weren't listening. The true horror behind Thomas's death was yet to be fully understood. But Sunderland is a city which has seen more than just one tragic tale unfold. In 2002, Leslie Purvis beat a young mum to death after a two-year campaign of bullying and intimidation. And just a year later, Mark Gorringe used a kitchen knife to stab a man to death after a row erupted on the street. Both men were jailed for life. But in 2005, the city would once again host horror on its doorstep. I'd grew up in the area. It's quite a close-knit area. Everybody knew everybody, and I felt, felt safe living there. Dean was 11. Oh, it was lovely. It was, it was no bother. It was so laid back, easy going, pleasant. Everybody knew him round, round where we lived. He had a lot of friends, he was quite popular. I was six months pregnant and we were moving into our new home. And we had a lot of decorating to do, preparing the house, buying baby things. Dean was always coming in with little gifts, little teddy bears. And he, he was really, really looking forward to having a little brother. Everything was falling into place. Um, life was very good and it was it was a very happy time. Janine had moved into a new home in Mordy Close and was adding the finishing touches. But her joy was about to be interrupted in the worst way possible. It was one summer evening I'd only lived in the house for five weeks and I was putting, got some little conifer plants and I was putting that a little, little area underneath my front sitting room window and I was planting them in there and Dane and his, and his friend from school were sitting on the step eating ice lollies. His friend stayed till roughly nine o'clock. He didn't live too far away from where we were before he went home, me and Dean went in, we got baths, jammers on, settled, and then we went to bed roughly 10 p.m. But shortly after 1 a.m., visitors arrived at the property and they had murderous plans. 
The initial call came in and it was from uh, a very distressed member of the public saying there was a fire in that premise. That call was ended uh, quite abruptly. Um, but at that time, other calls were coming in from neighbours in the street saying there was a serious fire. The crews were out the door um, when we attended the incident. We had three pumps there within seven minutes. It, it was evident from the outset, on arrival, that this was um, an unusual and quite a, a unique fire in terms of the ferocity of the flames and smoke coming out of the ground floor. The uh, UPVC door and front window had failed and uh, the flames were coming out of those very, very forcefully. There was a lot of people in the street because it was a lot of people, so it's a real scene of chaos that the officers turned up and had to deal with. Within six to eight minutes of ignition, which is a really quick time, the fire was fully involved, and that means that you know, everything was on fire in that house. The first crew went in, um, and under really difficult conditions, managed to attack the fire on the ground floor and, and get it under control. We knew that there was still potential persons reported. It's at that time that the crew was directed to go up to the first floor. The difficulty therein was that the stairs had failed. There was, there was no longer stairs there. Um, so the crews called out to get one of our short extension ladders and they used that to gain it, uh, entry to the first floor. At around about the time that they were completing a search on the first floor, a member of the public made us aware that there was a body in the back garden. The crew was sent around and that body was in fact an unconscious Janine. Our crews dragged her away from the scene of the fire with the assistance of the public and we gave her first aid until the paramedics arrived and she was immediately taken away to hospital. We're still not clear all these years later how it was that Janine was blown out that back window. I mean, the pressure of a backdraft. We're talking probably about a thousand degrees temperature. It's a miracle that Janine uh, survived that. Seven days later, and Janine was slowly waking up in hospital. I remember my eyes flickering and squinting and I could see lights and then I was drifting back out again. And then when I eventually did come round, I couldn't move. My back was broke. I had a fractured skull. I had a bleed on the brain and, and burns. Janine was lucky to survive, but that wasn't the only miracle. I was six months pregnant at the time and it was an amazing, absolute miracle how I mean, I was barely, I was barely hanging on in there, and me bit, and he was absolutely fine, not a thing wrong. Still to this day, I don't have any, any memory of anything whatsoever. But yet, I was informed that I, I was the first person to make a phone call to fire brigade, which I'm totally unaware about. As Janine recovered, she began to learn the full horror of what had unfolded and what had happened to her. Apparently, my body was found slumped up against the side of the house. I must have been blew out the window and then just dropped. I remember my brother sitting at the side of the bed. I just looked at him and he, he said, Janine, it's Dane. He didn't make it. Firefighters had done everything they could, but the fire had given little Dane no chance. Now they were faced with the task of finding out how the fire started and if anyone was to blame.
When the city of Sunderland learned about the tragic fire that had killed Dean Pike, they were shocked. But their disbelief would turn into anger when the details emerged of how the fire started. Janine had gone to bed at around 10 p.m., kissing Dean goodnight. But a fire had taken hold in the early hours and quickly ripped through the building. And investigations suggested the fire was arson. It takes a lot to get a fire to spread like that, and it's unusual fire. Our focus was working with the police scenes of crimes officers to establish uh, the cause of fire and um, how the fire had spread. In this circumstance, because of the ferocity of the fire, because of the strong smell of accelerant, because we found some lighter fuel in the garden next door and empty, kind of lighter fuel, we immediately centred our search around that front door. The fire service would go far and say it's, it's been started by an accelerant beam poured through the letterbox and that was the evidence in this case. The police were constantly, they were desperate to get in to speak to us. They kept asking me who done it, who who have I upset or who would I think, who had a grievance with me? And I was tell, tell them, telling them I didn't know, I didn't know. And I felt that they thought I was hiding something. To think that I was hiding someone that's come and killed my son is, it's a horrible feeling because I wouldn't have cared who had done it, who had set my house on fire. I would have gave the name if I, if, I, if I knew. You feel there's no reason why anybody should do this to me. Was it really for me? And as police explored all the avenues, they struggled to find a suspect too. It seemed the attack was random, or perhaps intended for someone else. Police took images of the pair to hospital to show Janine, in the hope of understanding the motive. I said, I'd, I'd never seen them before in my life. And they were, were saying, come on, Janine, how, how do you know them? I really don't know who they are. Dean Pike had been killed because arsonists had got the wrong address. With local tensions heightened, the pair were sent to face trial. It was hard to sit there and look at these two men um, that showed no remorse. They're just animals. To, to be able to do want to do something like that to another human being is, is beyond me, how, how their minds work. They're not human. I've been in a lot of fires in my time, 22 years I've been in the fire service. This is the worst fire that I've been to in my whole career. It affected everybody who went to that fire and still does to this day, I know for a fact. There is nothing more we could have done to um, prevent this happening. The only person who could have prevented this happening is by somebody choosing not to pour an accelerant and ignite it through a whole box. It had a massive effect on everybody that knew Dean. I've had cards and letters from people across the country, people who had, I don't, I've never met. The response was, it was lovely to know that so many people, even strangers, that actually care. 13 years on, Janine still struggles to get past the loss of Dean. But she's not alone. 
When the fire struck, she was six months pregnant. And now baby Mackenzie, who miraculously survived, is learning about what happened and his older brother. Mackenzie's aware of what happened to Dane. Him and Dane are a lot, are a lot in a lot of ways are alike with the football and the, the both were very thoughtful. Um, his teachers have, have said he talks about his brother a lot. For all he never met him, he still, he still talks about him. I'm proud to say I'm the mother of the two of them. This is the school that Dane attended, and this is a bench that the, his friends at the school raised the money between themselves and got this bench in his memory. And also uh, they paid for a brick at the, our football stadium, which was very, very thoughtful of the, the children. Obviously a traumatic time for them to hear about Dane's death, and especially in the way that he died. It just feels like it was just, it's just happened recent. But there's a lot of years, a lot of years gone by. He was 11. Six weeks before his 12th birthday, he had his whole life ahead of him. He would be 25 now. And his, his life was taken from him, from being in the safe, probably the safest place that he ever could be, was in his home with his mum, asleep in his bed, and his life was just taken from him. The bravery and resilience and personal strength Janine has shown to carry on with the life, it's got to be something to be admired. Dean's two killers were found guilty of murder and sentenced to more than 20 years each in prison. But while the city saw justice in that case, resolving the mysterious death of Thomas Kelly would take much longer. Thomas had been found dead in a fire at an allotment in the Roker part of the city. Police suspected he had gone to the allotments alone, perhaps to take drugs, and the fire had been an accidental death but his family didn't agree. To be fair to the police, they would deal with tragedies like this on a regular basis. A teenage boy found in a derelict building, all the signs of glue sniffing and a, and a fire to mask any uh, clear and obvious evidence of murder. So there'd be no obvious reason to cause concern. But the city would soon be rocked as another boy was found in similar circumstances. I found out about David Hansen at school. The teachers actually pulled us in from the yard and took us into a room and told us that there'd been another boy from the school found in a fire. It was just 10 weeks since Thomas had died. Now there was a second victim. David Hansen was three years younger, and unlike Thomas, he'd not been found in an allotment, but in a derelict property on Roker Terrace. But both boys attended the same school. Now the community was questioning whether the two deaths were connected or just a coincidence. The house where David Hansen was found is a 10 minute walk from where Thomas was found. So it's very local, it was all close to each other. The police started saying and putting out to the media that it was no drugs craze, but it didn't make sense at all. My mum and dad went mad. They were, they were saying there was no chance. Where's the, where's the evidence? Kept saying, where's the evidence then? If you think my son's taking drugs, my mum had said, you show me evidence of him, of him doing that. And there, there was no evidence at all. Now there were two deaths with striking similarities. Were these boys really dabbling with drugs? Or was there something far more sinister going on? A 
around that time, I remember talking to a police officer I knew, and he was saying that their feeling was the second body was just a coincidence. And nobody particularly raised an eyebrow that there was anything amiss. But then there was a third victim. Just three weeks later, 15-year-old David Grief suffered the same fate. And again, he went to the same school. This time, the body had been found in allotments, just 50 yards from where Thomas Kelly had been discovered. The similarities were obvious. David Grief was in the same year as David Hansen, both a year below me. He was found in the same allotment as my brother, in a burning shed. The police officer in charge had been on the television basically dismissing the deaths as glue sniffers. And um, there was a feeling that the, the families are obviously going to try to bat off and dismiss um, that, that allegation. Well, after the third, my mum, she didn't give up our fight. She kept, kept telling them, I can't have three boys just found. You know, none of them were known as drug takers. There was nothing found in them. Anybody would know that something like that is suspicious. That's not, it doesn't just happen. Someone's done that to them. The Sunland Echo had a very good reputation, um, a good name around the town, selling 70, 75,000 copies a day. And that was how the vast bulk of people in Sunderland got their news. After the third tragedy, we went down to see the families who were starting to um, make noise about their son's deaths. I always say, assume nothing, believe nobody, check everything. And uh, I was always very cynical about what people would say, but when we spoke to all three families and we started to hear what they're saying, and there was a common theme, they were decent lads. There was no obvious glue sniffing, and what the, the families were saying started to make sense. And we campaigned for the families and started to carry what they were saying in great depth and I think forced the police to actually do a much more thorough job on it. Around this time, a new lead detective was brought in and the investigation took a different direction. The officer who came in, Dave Wilson, was extremely thorough. Um, I'd known him from the days of when he was only a detective sergeant and he'd worked his way up through the ranks and he did everything by the book. He was very highly respected uh, amongst rank and file officers as somebody who was extremely thorough and extremely professional. Sunderland had now seen three boys die in just four months and nobody was questioning the family's view that this was more than just a coincidence. But when police finally did get to the bottom of it, they were in for an even bigger shock. In 1994, police in Sunderland were investigating the deaths of three boys in just four months. All three attended the same school, and all three had died in the same part of the city and their bodies found in fires. Now the police were set to make a breakthrough. I remember the day when the police confirmed that the three deaths were murders and they were linked. And that obviously caused huge shockwaves. It was now clear that these lads had been murdered. And we had a serial killer on the loose. That killer, police believed, was a local man called Stephen Greveson. He was older at 24 years of age, but he'd also attended the same school.
We knew all the time. We knew, we knew all the time he was in, Stephen Graveson was involved. Stephen Graveson was questioned within 24 hours of Thomas's murder and 24 hours of David Hansen's murder. He was a bad person. If people didn't know him, they knew of him. Indeed, Thomas Kelly, the first victim, did know Stephen Greveson. And he'd even revealed before his death that he was afraid of Greveson. Thomas would go on a line-up to help the place out and he would get paid £10 or something. This one time, Greveson was the suspect for burglary. And as far as I know, he'd walk past Thomas and he blamed him for what he'd said, shopping him up. And he was going to kill him. He was the only person that had threatened him. He was the only person he was really scared of. So Greveson had made threats to kill Thomas after being alongside him in a lineup for burglary. But could that be the motivation for murder? A court would decide, as forensic evidence linked Greveson to the scenes and he was charged with three deaths. When they came and said they were going to charge him, it felt it was relief that the police were listening to us all. We had to go to court because we were told so many different things at the beginning that we wanted to try and hear it properly and find out what really happened. It was our only chance we would get to hear it properly in court. He was denying and pleading not guilty. So I think the trial lasted at Leeds Crown Court for about five weeks. He stood there and laughed at us, stuck his fingers up at us, and he thought it was all a big joke. So when that jury foreman stood up and said guilty, I think we cheered. We cheered and, and then broke down. Stephen Greveson was jailed for the three murders. But unbelievably, there were more crimes that he was yet to be accused of. We had five murders in the week, all high profile. We were run off our feet, as were the police. Very uh, difficult murders for the police to handle. Um, Simon Martin being just one of those. There was obviously a lot of worry in the town about what was going on, even though they're all separate, unrelated murders. Simon Martin was 14 years old. He lived in the same area, and his death was three years before the spate of fires. Indeed, his murder was entirely different. Simon's body was found in a derelict building, and it had been a particularly brutal murder. He'd been beaten to death with weapons. Police found few clues in the property, and the only lead they had was a fingerprint that they assumed belonged to the killer. But when the fingerprint was matched, it came up with a local boy who denied all knowledge. It took a trial before the boy could be cleared, and police had to admit that they got the wrong man. All this meant the murder of Simon Martin remained unsolved until 2012, when a familiar name came into the frame. We always knew that Stephen Greveson was involved. So when he got arrested for that, we, we weren't shocked. We, we always knew. Greveson had confessed to the police, admitting killing Simon Martin and saying the murder had haunted him ever since. At trial, he was convicted and given a further life sentence. But many in the city couldn't help but feel that if Greveson had been caught after killing Simon Martin, then three more boys wouldn't have lost their lives. I'm angry with the police. I'll always be angry with the police. At, at the beginning, they just didn't do, do it right. I knew it wasn't right. I was 15 years old. I knew the way 
the way they were working just didn't make sense. I think the police wanted to brush it under the carpet, and if it only happened to Tom, I think they would have managed that. We all make mistakes in, in our jobs, and the police are no different, but I'm a strong believer that when the police do make mistakes, they have to be held to account. I mean, it's horrendous to think that had the families not got together and quite rightly kicked up a fuss about what had happened and what the, the police uh, weren't doing, that Grieveson would have got away with at least two murders, um, possibly three, and he's now been convicted of four. But who's to say what else that guy has done? The only insight we can get into Grieveson's behaviour is from a letter he penned to the family of Thomas Kelly. I don't think he'll ever walk the streets again, and that's a good thing. I'm angry that he, someone, one person can change so many lives. I miss my brother, Lords. Often wonder what he would be like. I think the bond that we have with the other families is give us more strength than doing it alone. You know, I've got someone in David's sister that knows exactly what I'm going through. We've made good friends, but friends that we wish we didn't know. On that day, 26th of November 1993, my life changed. Everything changed, and it'll never ever be the same. We live our lives, but we get on with our lives, but it's always there. It's always there. This is a city which has witnessed two unbelievable tragedies. A young boy who fell victim to two arsonists. And a local man hell-bent on killing who was able to slay four boys before he was convicted. It seems that in this murder town, the pain for those who have lost loved ones will never go away.